Today on the On.NET Show, Bridget's going to be telling us how to crunch huge amounts of data with .NET for Apache Spark in Azure. Check it out. Welcome to another episode of the On.NET Show. Today we have part two of .NET for Apache Spark with Bridget. So yeah, let's let's continue with this whole thing. Cool, yeah, I'm happy to be back. So in the last episode, we left off with um, just an example of some local batch processing, analyzing some GitHub data. So now we're gonna take a look at scaling, scaling that out to Azure, so using the power of the cloud with .NET for Apache Spark. And and like let's 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 ruin the, the ending. Does it work better? Like, uh, what where are we gonna get with this whole thing? Yeah, it definitely works better. Um, and I even have an example where we can see how we can analyze twenty gigabytes of data um, really quickly. Right, and I assume twenty gigabytes. Um, while that might slow your um, you know your your laptop down, that is not like cloud scale. What would what would you say would be a number that's like you know cloud scale? I would say terabytes or petabytes of data are definitely possible and will be a lot more efficient with Spark. But um, yeah, on your local machine, once you get past a certain number of megabytes, it's going to be super slow. So when you can even just get out to a few gigs or a few terabytes, you'll see massive improvements using Spark. Okay, uh, but Spark on Azure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Spark yeah. on Azure. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I thought that, that. I thought that's yeah. what you meant. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I take it, I'm guessing that the code you write is the same. Yep, same code. Okay, so how do we, um, I'm not too sure how you want to go through this topic, but I assume one of the questions would be, you know, what type of resource do I have to create in Azure? Like clearly it's not a website. Um, what do I need to deploy? Uh, is, is, you know, is it all those things that were in our project file that we looked at last time? Yeah, essentially, um, what we need to deploy is you can run a .NET publish on um, that application, and you'd publish it to Linux or to Ubuntu specifically. And then you just need that zipped up um, container of files from your app. And then you can go ahead and submit that zip file and maybe some extra like input files or things like that um, to your Spark engine of your choosing. And we have several different Spark engines that we can use in Azure for deploying .NET for Spark apps to the cloud. Um, so a couple of ones that we can explore include Azure Databricks, um, Azure HD Insight, and Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, and with the first two, Databricks and HD Insight, we're able to um, do those today. We have installation docs online, and .NET is actually offered as an out-of-the-box language on HD Insight. Um, it's not offered as an out-of-the-box language on Azure Databricks, but we do have some simple setup guides online, um, which I'll link to also at the end. Um, but with Azure Synapse Analytics, that's the demo that we'll be performing today and taking a look at shortly. And that is a new technology so that is still in a preview state. Right. So you mentioned these um, three services. Uh, you know, would people know which one it is that they want to use or are there reasons to choose one versus the other? I would say it could be a little bit of both. I would say some companies that have already been um, using or investigating big data um, might already favor one of the services. So for instance, some customers are already familiar with Azure HD Insight. And so they know as they start integrating .NET for Apache Spark, they want to stick with HD Insight because that's what their production pipelines are using. Whereas for Azure Synapse Analytics, that is a completely new offering that we announced at the end of last year. And that can be a really great tool um, for users who maybe aren't already using HD Insight or Databricks, for instance, and they see that, okay, for instance, with Synapse Analytics, we can ingest data from a lot of different sources, do next generation of data warehousing, and all the awesome new capabilities there sound interesting for my use case. Okay, so it sounds like we're not going to answer that particular question today. That That's a uh, a little out of scope, but there is a lot of uh, you know value that those services offer. Okay, so how about you actually show us? Sure, so I will go ahead and share my screen here and we can take a look at running in Azure Synapse Analytics. 
So we'll start off by going to the Azure portal. So I can do that by just going to portal.azure.com, which is where I can manage and create new Azure resources. And as the Azure portal loads here, we're going to be able to see a couple of the recent resources that I've been working with. So specifically, I want to take a look at my Synapse workspace. But you can see that previously I was working with like HD Insight and some other Spark engines. But we're going to look at Synapse for this demo. So as I click on my resource here and it loads, we're going to be able to see some standard resource information like the resource group and the subscription for our Synapse workspace. Um, so here it's loaded. And we can also see that we have some Apache Spark pools at the bottom. So you may be wondering, what is an Apache Spark pool? And that is essentially the set of compute or the set of worker or executor nodes that are going to be used to um, run our big data code. So I have a couple already created here, but if I'd wanted to create a new one, I could go ahead and do that in our Synapse workspace. Um, yeah. And what would be the reason for, for doing that? Like what, yeah. So in order to be able to run any of our Apache Spark apps, we need resources or compute to do so. And so I would need at least one of those here. So if I didn't have any, I could go and create a new one um, in Synapse. I see, but with the work that you do, you just assign it to, to one pool as opposed to multiple. Correct, yeah, okay. you just assign it to one pool. Right, and then in, then in terms of like the scale of compute, that's where that size column comes in. Exactly, so if I actually clicked on the dialog to create a new Spark pool so that we could see some of the components that it requires. Um, so of course a name, and then we can see there's different node sizes. So larger nodes will give us more compute power. Um, we also have an auto scale feature so that depending on the needs of our app, we can either use um, more nodes or fewer nodes. Um, and Spark and Synapse will be intelligent enough to be able to scale for us. And then we can also have a number of nodes here. So minimum and a maximum that we'd want to include. And then some additional settings. We also have this really cool feature um, called auto pause, which allows us to automatically um, stop the Spark pool from running if we haven't used it in a certain number of minutes, which is really cool so you don't get charged on Azure for a resource that you're not actively using. Um, but since we already have a couple of Spark pool options created, I'm going to go ahead and just go back to my workspace here. And I'm going to click Launch Synapse Studio. So as this loads here, I'll click here. I just have the, the home page for Azure Synapse Analytics to give a little bit of insight of what Synapse actually is. But um, as it says here, it's Azure SQL Data Warehouse Evolved. So it's like the next generation of data warehousing. Now, data warehousing is when we're working with data from a lot of different sources. So maybe from some different databases and input files and devices and things like that. And we want to read in or ingest all that data, um, perform some sort of calculations on it, and then maybe finally gain some new insights through machine learning algorithms or through plotting it in Power BI, which is all built in as part of our Synapse workspace. So if I go back to Synapse Studio here, it's now loaded. And on the sidebar here, we have um, the different steps of the big data pipeline, the different things that we would do when working with our data. So when I start off with the data tab or the data hub over here, we can see that we can automatically access databases and storage accounts so we have access to in Azure. So we have a storage account linked to our Synapse workspace specifically. And as it loads, um, it's loading any sort of input files or other storage mechanisms we've uploaded to our storage account. So we'd be able to view um, anything in data sets, let's say. So I have this file or this folder here called ghtorrent, where I've stored some GitHub data from the ghtorrent website, which just includes a bunch of different um, GitHub files about like commits and projects, things like that. And we can see here that we have a few different files uploaded so we can analyze some more GitHub projects data, but on a larger scale than we did on our local machine. So now I can go to the develop tab over here, and this is where we can actually start working with the .NET for Apache Spark code. So when we're working with different cloud providers like Synapse, um, there's typically a couple different ways that we can work with our big data code. We can do a batch submission, which is super similar to what we saw in Visual Studio in the last episode, where we submit our whole app at once. 
or we could use notebooks, which are these really cool um, entities that allow us to submit maybe just a single line or a single cell of code. So we'll take a look at both since both are options here. So I already have a Spark job definition titled GitHub um, that's going to go ahead and use that same code that we wrote in Visual Studio. Um, and as I had mentioned, all we had to do was run .NET publish um, and we have this zip file um, that we created from the publish folder. So after we had published, I just went into my folder directory, zipped up those published files and created this GitHub projects.zip. And then main executable file is the name of the app that we'll be running, which is just GitHub projects in this case. And then we can include any sort of command line arguments or other reference files we need. So in our case, we just need to know the input file, which is going to be that same input file, the projects data. And then if we scroll down, we can see some more submission information. Um, we can choose a Spark pool here. So we can see we had both of the pool options that we saw before in the Azure portal. And we can choose the number of executors and the size of those executors. And again, more executors with a larger size means that our data will be executed even more quickly. And at the top of our job definition here, I had chosen .NET Spark, which includes C Sharp and F Sharp, but Synapse also includes options for other languages. So all I would have to do is click Submit here, and our app will begin to submit. Um, but since I have already submitted this in the past, we can go ahead and take a look at some previous runs we've done and see the results of those. So we can see the run that's currently submitting. But let's say I just want to look at the last 30 days of Spark job submissions. Let's look at the most recent successful one. You can see that it took three minutes. Um, and we can take a look at our output here. So I'll just change to standard output. And we can see that we have the same output we had had from our local batch submission. So first it was the not cleaned up data, just the raw data of our projects. And then specifically um, the cleaned up data and the average number of times each language has been forked. So same exact code, same exact results. Now we can run it in Azure. So you can run um, more gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data at really fast speeds. Right. So it sounds like, um, you know, it took this three minutes and nine seconds based on the configuration that you selected. But I'm, I'm gathering that there's a even bigger configuration you could have selected if you wanted that three minutes to be to be less. Absolutely. Yeah, I could have chosen um, larger exec executor nodes. I could have chosen more nodes. Both of those, um, both of those are options there for sure. Great. OK, so now that we've seen a batch submission, let's take a look at a notebook because notebooks are really cool and interesting um, in big data and ML applications. I have this notebook titled GitHub Projects. So again, we're completing the same task, but in yet another new format. So um, similar to a batch submission, we need to um, choose the Spark compute or the Spark pool that we're using. And we also choose a language. So here we have specifically chosen C Sharp. So, uh, you know, we saw that before as well. I assume, you know, if you chose Java or Scala for this, it just wouldn't work, right? Because the code that you wrote is, uh, isn't is expecting C-sharp, so those those have to match in some way, I assume. Exactly, yeah, because when you choose a certain language here, it's going to go to go with the kernel or the way to process that language specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah, but scrolling down here, we can see that we can have um, both text cells, so to tell an interesting story for our data, help give some context and explanations, and then we can have code cells as well, and we can run one cell at a time or you could run all the cells at once um, if we were curious to see the output of all of our data at once. But we can see we can do the same tasks, um, but in a really cool interactive way here where we can divide up our tasks into the individual cells. So first we just write in our data, then we can do our data prep in separate cells, um, take a look at that, um, and then we can go ahead and analyze our prepped data through a couple more steps here as well. Right. So this this um, particular one is kind of more tutorial based, but I could imagine in a business setting that you you um, particularly after you get past the boilerplate aspects of this, that you um, might take someone through your reasoning that is relating to the analysis that you're doing so that you can, you know, 
convince someone of, you know, we should do this business initiative because, you know, here's my reasoning, here's the actual spark code, and then look at look at these results. Is could you imagine something like that? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the beauty of notebooks that um, they're oftentimes used as a learning or a tutorial tool, kind of like this, as you had mentioned, but then they're definitely applicable to the use case you just mentioned. Um, they're a great tool to collaborate with other data scientists or other engineers or other business people on your team to explain why you took certain actions and what actions your company should take next. Um, and then world, world domination, that's that's the usual one I'm after. That's that, I feel like that's a good goal. I feel like that's a good standard goal that we should yeah. All, yeah. all all look for. No, no, just for <laughs> just for clarity, I am I'm not after that at all. Um, and then we can also do some really cool visualizations with our data. Um, so, for instance, we can use um, this library called Plotly. So, in a cell, we can say using xplot.plotly. And then we can go ahead and gain some even more um, interesting visual insights from our data. So for instance, if we wanted to take a look at developer commit patterns over a week, maybe if we wanted to see how productive our company is being during different points of the week and how we could improve productivity, we could do a really interesting visual like this. So then we can help um, convey um, other stories in our company as well. Yeah, I'd definitely like to see more from the PowerShell team on Saturdays. Um, <laughs> not, not, not high enough. Yeah, this the Saturday number, the the Code Hub Saturday numbers is pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to talk to them. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a an example of using both batch submission and notebook submission um, with Donet for Apache Spark in Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, and if we wanted to take a look at another interesting example, something a little bit more advanced using Donet for Apache Spark, we could also take a look at how we can combine .NET for Apache Spark with the power of machine learning and ML.NET, because I have an example with that as well. Okay, so those two things are, you know, compatible and, uh, you know, complementary. Yes, definitely. Wow. Okay, I hadn't, I hadn't, actually I have to admit that didn't even occur to me. Um, so could you tell, could you share like from a roles and responsibilities standpoint, what you would think of Apache Spark doing and what would you see ML.NET doing in some sort of application or maybe in the one you're about to show us? Absolutely. Um, should I, I can go ahead and switch screens to the application here. For sure. Um, okay. So for instance, when we want to apply something to each row of our data frame, we use something called a user-defined function or a UDF. Um, so in this example here, we're able to use a UDF that applies machine learning to every row of our data frame. So we're able to actually apply ML.NET to all of our input data. Um, and we're able to do that intelligently and efficiently um, since we're also accessing Apache Spark with .NET for Apache Spark. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so to get into the actual code here, um, similar to the GitHub example that we had done in the previous episode, this is just a C Sharp console application on my local machine in Visual Studio, and I have already installed the Microsoft Spark NuGet package. So I already have these jar files added to my project. So in this example here, I'm curious to understand a little bit more about sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is a machine learning task where we want to understand if a statement or piece of text um, represents a positive or a negative statement. So if I said, I love Apache Spark, that would be a positive sentiment because it's something good. Whereas I hate inefficient big data queries it would be a negative sentiment because that's something bad. So in our case, we're going to be reading in some input data from Yelp, and we want to determine if the reviews are positive or negative. And we're going to do that by combining .NET for Apache Spark and ML.NET. So we start off our program here by creating a Spark session, just like we do in any .NET for Spark app. I've named our app here .NET for Apache Spark Sentiment Analysis. And we're also going to read in our Yelp reviews. So now that we've created a Spark session, read in our data, 
we can go ahead and start setting up the structure that we'll need to go ahead and apply machine learning to all of the data that Spark is able to read in and then process quickly. So here we have created a new UDF, which is a user defined function, and it takes in a string, which is going to be that input review text from Yelp, and it produces a Boolean output, which is going to be a zero for a negative review or a negative sentiment and a one for positive. And we've named our UDF ML UDF. And in our UDF, we're going to apply a sentiment method. And sentiment, I just have created down below here. And it has some ML.NET code that performs sentiment analysis. So if you've used ML.NET at all, or if you're, if you're familiar with any of their API, you'll see that we're using the standard API here with iTransformer and prediction engine and um, some other prediction information here. So if we scroll back up here, now that we've created a UDF, which is going to apply ML.NET to every row of our input data, we want to actually apply that UDF. So what we can do here is you can actually create SQL calls in Spark, which is super convenient um, if you're familiar with SQL syntax at all. So we can use that standard SQL syntax to go ahead and apply ML.NET. So we're using that um, UDF we created up here. So here I'm just going to go ahead and apply ML UDF to column one, which is um, the column that is it's column one is a label in our input data, and that's what contains all of our input reviews. And we're able to then select both column one and the predicted sentiment from our review data. And then we call show so we can go ahead and display our information to see what the predicted reviews are. So how well did ML.NET perform um, while well, we were also able to call the ML.NET code using .NET for Apache Spark? So let's go ahead and I've also already run this app. Um, and I just went ahead and navigated into the apps directory, did a .NET build, and then used that Spark submit command to deploy my app. So I have Spark submit, the .NET runner, um, the jar file, um, our app's DLL. Since we do have a UDF, if you have a UDF in your app, you will need to include the DLL for your application, and then a couple of inputs. So one of our inputs is the input file, so yelp.csv, and the other one is this mlmodel.zip, which is the zipped up machine learning model that we created um, using ml.net. So if we want to take a look at our output, um, the first thing that we had output in our program was just the raw um, Yelp data that we read in. So these are the true values. So these are all the reviews, and these are all of the actual sentiments. So we can see when someone loved something, that was one, that was a positive sentiment. But when they said, oh, the crust is not good, that's negative, so that's a zero. So then the next thing we did was we used that Spark UDF to apply ML.NET efficiently to each row of our input data. And let's see how well um, our machine learning model performed here. OK, awesome. So now these are actually the predictions that we got. So we can see, again, when someone loved something, that's considered true, so positive sentiment. When the crust was not good, that was still false. That was still a negative sentiment. So these are our predicted values from using ML.NET. So very cool. We were able to combine .NET for Spark and ML.NET in one C Sharp console app. Okay, that looked really good. Um, there was one question I had while we were walking through that, and it, it seems like, um, you know, with ML.NET, I'm sure you could use it by itself and have it look at more than more than one row of data and you know produce some sort of report. Uh, is there a sense that? You know, when a data set gets too large, that maybe using uh, ML.NET by itself is probably not the best choice, and you should use a big data solution like um, Apache Spark in concert with ML.NET. Like, how, how do you think about th that topic? Yeah, so I would say that's definitely a good way to think about it is that when you have a large quantity of data, it's always really smart to think about how you can apply a big data solution like Apache Spark or specifically .NET for Apache Spark. And I think in our case, um, or just in any case, using ML.NET and .NET for Spark together, 
there's a lot of applications in which it makes sense. So for instance, um, if you want to clean up your data, um, because in order to actually get accurate training and prediction with machine learning, it's really important to have really properly prepared or cleaned up data. And we saw in our GitHub example that .NET for Spark is a great way to easily clean up data and to do it quickly and efficiently. So in that example alone, um, it's a good idea to combine .NET for Spark and ML.NET. But it can also be useful, for instance, for scaling the prediction. Um, so in order to more effectively apply machine learning models um, repeatedly at a larger scale. I see. So when I was when I was actually asking the question, I was thinking only about inference. Um, but it sounds like you could also use uh, ML.NET and Spark.NET uh, together for um, training as well. Um, I think for the training, um, we don't have the capability specifically for combining ML.NET and .NET for Spark. I, um, I believe that it's just for um, like applying for the prediction, like we did in our case here with the sentiment analysis model. I see. Okay, makes sense. Okay, well, I think this was a great uh, part two. We definitely saw a big expansion of what we're able to do with um, uh, .NET for Apache Spark beyond yeah, what we saw in the first video. So that was awesome. So where should people go to get started? I actually forgot to ask that in the, in the first video. No, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if you go to dot.net slash spark, that'll be the landing page on the .NET website for .NET for Apache Spark. And from there, you can go to a couple different places. So you can go to our GitHub repo. We are completely open source. So you can go ahead and take a look through our API. You can contribute or open a PR or an issue. Um, with any sort of contributions there. And we also have an examples folder there that has the different examples that I showed today. Um, so it had the ML example and it also had the previous GitHub example along with some others. And, and, what, we also and what's the URL for that? Um, that is just github.com slash .NET slash Spark. Okay, so it's, so it's super a easy. .NET, yeah, the .NET ecosystem of GitHub, and then specifically it's um, Spark. So if you just search .NET for Spark on GitHub, you'll be able to find it there. And then, yeah, and we also have um, .NET for Spark um, docs on the Microsoft doc, doc site. So if you just search up Microsoft docs .NET for Apache Spark, you'll also be able to find some really helpful tutorials and guides there as well. Wow, sounds like we've uh, we've got everything covered. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, uh, as a longtime .NET member, team member, this just the fact that you know all of our new projects are on GitHub is open source is just so amazing. It's like, yeah, just just go to that GitHub thing, the .NET org. It's it's probably there. So it makes yeah. me very happy. Okay. Well, thanks again for being on the show. And, uh, you know, this was an awesome two episode look at uh, .NET for Apache Spark with, you know, Bridget uh, telling, us, telling us the whole story. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me.